Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're back for another episode of the Fresh Crits of Melbourne. It's been a long time between drinks. I took a little bit of extended break over in Europe and Middle East. We're back, and we've got a special episode in store for you. You can see this is not your average crit. This is one of the filthiest races you'll see. We're down at Creswick for the Dirty Pig and Whistle 2023 edition. We're just about to get started. This ain't your normal crit race. This is a fully fledged gravel race. Now I've done one gravel race before. This is my first time doing the pig and whistle and the conditions were not ideal. You can see the mud on the CX course there and look at the riders behind. It's an absolute chop fest. We're just trying to get right position. You don't want her to be stuck by a rider who uh, who miss, puts his wheel and ends up in the mud. It's the last thing you want to do. And to make matters even more difficult, you've got Lewis Bull in my ear for the first 10 minutes of this race. Constantly trying to dive bomb me, trying to get around, push me off a bike. He's an absolute menace, but rode really, really well in this one. So this race had a lot of hitters. You've got here Derek on the right in the orange kit and the camelback. We've got Bentley, who's an absolute hitter when it comes to crit races. Let's see how he does on his nice uh, Cervelo Aspero today. Also featuring in this race was EF Superstar and resident podcast uh, expert Mitch Docker. He was down in this one as well, riding with the crew. Um, as well as we had uh, Mitch Cooper, I think Murray was here, who came second place at Tour of Mansfield and Masters A. So, look, safe to say it was not going to be an easy race. It was going to be full gas from the start. I uh, wasn't ready for it, but you know, I probably should have expected it if I'm honest. So if you're new to the channel, if you're new to Fresh Crits, I strap cameras to the bike and go out and race. If it's CX racing, crit races, road races, or like we have here, gravel bikes. And so if you dig stuff like this, please hit the like and subscribe button. It does the channel a hell of a lot of favors. But enough about that. What I want to do now is discuss the structure of this video and how it's going to kind of play out. So in every Fresh Crits video, there are chapters at the bottom. So you can always skip through to your favorite section, wherever you need be. Um, but the way we're going to roll this one is we're going to discuss the course and how the two different sections work and the, t the timings and everything like that. We'll talk about the gravel that we went over. Um, we're also going to touch on equipment for sure and how I went about this race, what kit I was running. Uh, we'll touch a little bit on nutrition and then most importantly, look at some of the, my favorite clips of the race that I want you guys to see. So without further ado, let's get stuck into the course. So the course itself, as you can see on the map here, is located in the northwest of Melbourne, maybe one and a half hours drive. And the funny thing is, it is very close to Bunningong, where we have our national road race um, every year, where Luke Plapp has now won two years in a row. So up in that sort of area, it can be quite hilly, a lot of steep little bergs to be aware of. And you can see here, we're coming down um, a pretty treacherous bit of uh, almost single track, um, super muddy. Um, and that's the sort of climate you get in the northwest of Victoria. It can be muddy like this. So just coming to keep in mind of if this race comes around next year as tyre choice is imperative. Now, this race, the Dirty Pig, is set up into two timed sections with a period in the middle where you can actually chill out and get some refreshments. So I've got the first half of the race up on the screen now, and that's what this video is gonna be focusing the majority on because this has had the most um, variety of gravel to be going over. We have the loose stuff that we're on now. There was single track, hard pack, grass, mud, and everything in between. So you've really had to keep on your toes throughout the first half of the race. Whilst the second half is the majority hard packed gravel, your fire road sort of stuff. So you don't need to be as switched on for line choice and anything like that, which to be honest is a good thing because I couldn't even see straight by the time I got onto the second sector. Now the wind on this day played a huge factor and you can see in the bottom right hand corner we've got our little white outline map there. The wind was coming through at a southwesterly direction um, and for the majority of the race it felt very little tailwind, a lot of crosswind and then as soon as you get onto that second sector it was all a headwind. It was absolutely brutal on tired legs. So crosswinds did play quite a big factor here. Um, so it was really important that you kept, in order to you know preserve some energy, making sure you're staying on the downwind side of the rider that was in front of you. So if that's left or right, dependent on where you are on the course. So 
That's a bit of a breakdown of how the race was kind of played out. Like I said before, it was done in two time sections. So the first section was timed. You have a break in the middle where you can get your nutrition needs, have a Coke, eat a gel, whatever. And then as soon as you cross the next timing chip, your overall time would start again. And at the end of the day of racing, whomever has the shortest amount of time to complete the circuit, is the winner of the race, which is awesome. So, so with these editions of the Dirty Pig and Whistle, there were three different entry distances you could sign up for, a 40, 80, and a 120. Um, as you can see on the right-hand side, I did sign up to the 120, so I was looking at four hours of pain on the bike, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But this is one of my favorite sections here. Um, nice bit of downhill. Uh, Lewis got forced wide by Derek. Bit of laughing going on there, but straight away, the guys in the front group were stepping on it. Look, you can see almost 600 watts in order to stay in the wheels. And we're only five and a half minutes into this race and it's already been full gas. My normalized power this far into the race was at like 400 watts, which is crazy. And definitely not sustainable for me with uh, not all that much fitness in the legs at this early in the season, but still fun nonetheless. So I think the attitude of the guys on the front was to try to hit it as hard as you could, um, try to get rid of as many tag alongs as possible, um, and then roll to the finish with a select group of people. You can see here the screech of the brakes as we try to navigate our way through um, some pretty dicey sections there. You don't know how deep those puddles are, and the last thing you want to do is end up on your ass, in the mud, six minutes into a race. So the road we're currently on now is on a bit of a false flat. Uh, it's, it's a slight drag up to the top of this hill. We're probably, you know, pushing it 4% gradient here. Added to the idea that it's um, a super rough four-wheel drive track, really convex um, road, which means you can, if you slip into a ditch, that's race over. Um, added to the leaf litter that's all over the road, and because it's been so wet, it makes for a really slippery circuit. So making sure you're picking the right lines in order to not only get traction, but stay comfy on the bike is imperative. Now you can see here, there's been a little bit of a surge up the road and I'm pushing four, almost 500 watts just to stay with the guys in front. And you know, like I said before, it's been so hot the start of this race. Seven minutes in, I'm struggling to hold the wheel. We've got Josh Brugger here, it's first gravel race out on his Aspero, doing whatever he can to stay in the mix. And there's a whole bunch of riders scrambling in order to keep with this move. Now, I'm not too panicked. Obviously, I'd like to be on the wheel, but the fitness isn't where it probably was uh, during the summer season. But I've got this route uh, saved into my Garmin and I know that there's a Berg that's soon to be finishing maybe a kilometer, maybe less up the road here. So I'm thinking if I can just stay in contact with these guys, I'll be able to hopefully crest the top and be able to work with a couple of other riders to bridge across. So I'm just riding quote unquote a tempo effort not too fussed about other riders um, passing me, not too fussed about the gap opening up too much, hoping that I can just stay within reach of the leaders as we get to the steepest parts of this climb. And you can see it's a pretty much, a, a, I guess, a form of fire road, this one. It's not very technical. And like I said before, it's just about finding the fastest line possible through here. If you can just make out the rear cam, we've got Ryan Schilt in the, in the rear there um, from Bike Gallery. He's putting in a huge effort in order to stay with the move. Um, it is just survival at this point on. Eight minutes in, and it's been so hot right from the beginning. You're just doing whatever you can to stay with the bunch. All right, just fast forward, and you can see the leaders cresting the top now and making the left-hand turn to a bit of a flatter section and I am working so hard just to try to stay with this 179 beats. I'm not feeling too great anyway coming into this race, but I'm absolutely dying right now. It's, I'm not in a good place and I'm only 10 minutes in. This is not, not good. But, you know, there's nothing more I can do. I'm trying to put out as much watts as I can. I don't think I'm gonna be able to stay with these hitters from the front. All I want is to have some company, hopefully, that's able to A, bridge across to these top guys, or at least roll turns it with. So we've got Derek here, who's recently been training for Unbound, and I believe, don't quote me on this, he was the first unprofessional rider at Unbound. Oh, I'm not sure if that's right. I know he did really, really well, so comment below if I um, if I got that wrong, as I'd love to hear how he got on. Um, 
And I'm happy just to sit in his wheels. A really strong, powerful athlete. Races a hell of a lot on the road as well. We feature in the Tour of Mansfield stage. And um, I'm happy if I can just sit on his wheel, knowing full well that I'm a lot lighter than him. So hopefully I'm going to be able to stay with him on the climbs like we are now. And he'll be able to, with his raw power, essentially drag me across to the front group when we get to uh, the flatter parts of the course. It's definitely worth mentioning that I owe Derek a beverage of his choice for the work he put in to drag me back to the bunch. So uh, huge shout out to Derek there. Let's skip forward to where we get a little bit closer to the guys in front. Stay tuned. So we skip forward six or so minutes and I'm not gonna lie, Derek basically pulled me across. I think I pulled this final turn just to, to get us um, onto these riders in front, but he was on the front draw, absolutely drilling it. Um, for about six minutes to get us across here. So he's in absolutely ripper form at the moment. You can see we've got Josh and three other riders who are um, just trying to get crest over this uh, last final hill here, this little berg. Now, the main group, the main bunch of riders who we saw crest over the hill a couple of minutes ago, they're long gone now. You know, they are well in front and that's the select few of absolute hitters. Um, as this rider flicks me through, he's obviously struggling a little bit. And we've got Ryan Shield from Bike Gallery stepping up to the plate. This is his first gravel race. And um, I don't think he's even ridden on a gravel bike before up until this race. So he's doing really well, all things considered, representing Bike Gallery quite nicely there. Um, Josh Brooke, obviously, with Cycle Speed. These guys, it's a good group. You know, we know all these guys are going to work. So I'm going to do what I can to stay with this bunch for as long as I can. Because the last place you want to be on, with 107 k's left is riding solo. A couple of minutes we've skipped ahead and we're riding, riding on some pretty corrugated road here. Really, really bumpy, plenty of potholes. And it isn't until Joshy does a little bit of a bunny hop over a massive puddle, throws the chain off, and he looks down and realized he can't get the chain back on. So as I ride past, I'm saying, just relax, throw the chain on, don't panic. And that's exactly what he does. He pulls over and throws it on. The last thing you want to be doing in situations like that is panicking, um, breaking derailers as you try to put the chain back on. Just relax. You've got plenty of time to get it done. And Josh is back with us in no time as Derek puts in another huge effort to bridge across. All righty, we skip forward another seven or so minutes and Josh has just come back to join us after his little mechanical he had earlier. And these guys are ripping a good turn on the front, but they've missed the left-hand turn here. You can see the signs. They've missed it. I almost miss it. I slam on the brakes, finally get through. Poor Josh and the other guy keep riding on. It's like it's not hard enough since he's already had a mechanical and sprinted on. Now he has to jump on the brakes, turn around and come back this way. I definitely recommend for any sort of road race or gravel race or anything like that where you have to make you know, corners and turns and stuff to load it up into your garment. It'll pre-notify you of when you need to make those corners and just makes life a hell of a lot easier. It's been six or so minutes since the last clip where we missed the where we missed the turn there. And Josh, you can see in the rear cams joined us. This these crosswinds, these towel crosswinds are absolutely grueling. I can't get a sit and I'm working so hard just to stay in the wheel of Ryan. And um, I'm just struggling, really, really struggling. Heart rate at 178, really maxing out threshold right now. I needed Josh to come through to help provide some support for me. Um, as you can see here, in the last um, in the last six minutes, Derek actually attacked the group, or not so much attack, but rode off the front. He's just the stronger rider on the day. But he's realized that he needed to sit up, or maybe just we caught him. Um, and we eventually catch him up and, and roll a group of four um, in this section trying to catch the lead group. Like I said before, there's probably about 16 or so riders up the road. Now, obviously, they're probably working pretty well together and they're proper hitters, so the likelihood of, ca of, the, of us catching them is quite slim. Um, ideally, in this part of the race, we should just be riding a nice tempo, stay recovered, knowing full well there's 100 k's of gravel ahead of us. So you can see here, now, this is one of the, the smoother parts of the circuit. Nice tarmac. Um, especially when you're on gravel, gravel tyres. Look, you're not going too fast, 34 kilometres an hour, but it's a bit nicer and a bit smoother to ride on this than it is on that corrugated gravel stuff. But it isn't till the road starts to go uphill that we're pushing 350 watts just to stay in the wheel. Me and Ryan look at each other and we're like, mate, this is no point. Why are we working so hard? There's so long to go in this race. So we essentially sit up and let both Josh and Derek to go on their way, work together as two um, to try to catch the lead group. Now, 
who knows if this was a good call at the time. They were obviously pre- feeling pretty strong. Um, meanwhile, me and Ryan were kind of wanting to wait, look behind to see if there was another group of maybe six or so riders that we could work together, roll turns with, and, um, and meet everyone back at Clunes. But what we'll do now, now that those guys are riding off, um, and me and Ryan are gonna wait for the next bunch of riders to come through, why don't we talk about the gear setup? Let's skip over to that now. Here is my absolute weapon of a rig that I was riding for the Dirty Pig and Whistle. Obviously the frame, you they're everywhere these ones. Focus Mara's, I think I picked it up cheap during COVID. Um, alloy frame, carbon fork. Mara's is a um, CX bike, but the jury's still out if it's what's the difference between a gravel and a CX bike. I'm sure everyone's gonna pipe up in the comments below to let me know. Um, it's a 42 tooth front chain ring. Um, the rear cassette is 11 speed, 42 11. So I've got a one to one um, ratio there um, with a mountain bike derailleur. It's obviously a one by. Um, I'm running, I put on 38 mil bars for this race because I wanted to get as air as I possibly could. Probably not the best if you want to be doing gravel riding, although I've ridden now single track on it. And do you know what? It's absolutely fine. Uh, the rotors, obviously they're SRAM ones. I think they're 160s. Now, the couple of big upgrades I did for the Dirty Pig and Whistle were my tire and wheel choices. Let's start off the exciting one. So the wheels I'm running, I'm trying these ones and I was very, very impressed. These are the Winspace Lawn Hyper D45 disc brake wheel set. And uh, essentially the front is 46 mil, the rear is about 54 with a 21 mil internal width. Carbon spokes, ceramic bearings, super, super lightweight, about 1400 grams. Coming off my alloy ones, which I think were almost two kilos, this was a massive upgrade for me. Now, these are not built for gravel. Uh, in fact, on the lacing pattern on the drive side is, I think, a two cross, um, whilst on the, on the non-drive side, it's single. I mean, there's no cross. It's just a radial laced pattern. So they're definitely not built for gravel, but in saying that, I trashed them. I was bunny hopping over things, crashing them into gutters and everything, and they absolutely held up just fine. I was extremely impressed with these wheels, and um, I've actually been fortunate enough to be lent them. And if you guys wanted to try these as well, hit me up in the comments, chuck me a DM on Instagram at Fresh Crits, and um, I'm happy for you guys to try some. Uh, if you're interested in buying them now, special promo, first time ever at Fresh Crits, I'll link it below, but... Uh, as of today, you've got $100 off if you want to pick up these wheels on the Australian Windspace website. So check out the link below, uh, add my promo code in there, and um, yeah, 100 bucks off, game on. So as for rubber, so I'm running with these ones. Uh, I bought specifically for the race a Pirelli Centuro Gravel Edition, which is a pretty fast running rear tire. And on the front, I've just got a Maxxis um, Rambler both 40 mil wide. Um, I just wanted a bit more grip on the front. In hindsight, probably could have got something a little bit more faster rolling resistance. Like if you're looking to do the Melbourne to Warney, where grip really isn't an issue so much, you just want faster rolling speeds. I'm gonna have to do a bit of research and find a faster front. Uh, but I was really, really happy with that um, rear Pirelli. And that pretty much wraps up my gear choice. If you have any questions, hit me up in the comments, chuck me a DM on Insta and be more than happy to answer. Um, all right, let's get back to some racing. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that little kit setup uh, clip that I just put together there. Now we're back into the racing, 60 minutes in, just over an hour, and there's still 90 kilometers of gravel left. And the good thing is we've just hit a, we've just gone over a berg and the group where that's caught up to um, me and Ryan are really strong, um, wanna work. It's a good bunch to ride with. Um, so we've got a nice little crew going that can work together here. Now, interesting thing about the stuff we're riding on now, it looks quite hard packed, but it's actually quite soft due to all the rain that we've had um, under the tires. So it's all about being light on the bike. And what I tend to try to do is either shift back on the saddle to lighten up the front wheel. Um, I feel like that gives the bike, it releases it a little bit more from um, from from the, uh, the wet sand, I suppose, and allows me to ride what I feel like is a little bit quicker. So I would definitely 
practice this sort of stuff, riding really far forward on the saddle, really far back on the saddle, light on the bars to change the weight of the bike dependent on the surface that you are riding on. So I'm gonna skip a little bit forward in this clip to the fun descent and show you a little, a few different cornering styles that you can practice uh, whilst you're riding out in the gravel whip. Let's skip ahead. So we're hooking down this one, 50 kilometers an hour. I didn't realize how sharp this left hand was and I completely overcook it. Now, it kind of raises an important question here. If you know you're gonna not make a corner, your tires can only have so much traction. You can either be full steering into a corner um, or you could be all on the brakes. You can't do both. Well, you can, but you'll probably end up on your ass. So if you know you're gonna be going wide on a corner, try to pick a soft landing spot where you can jump on the anchors and wash out all that speed where possible. Now, the great thing about these gravel tires and these gravel bikes is there is so much traction, especially if you're running tubeless like I am and you're running low pressures. I think I was running like uh, 30s on the rear and about 26 on the front, that's PSI. Um, and, and a lot of people can run lower and they end up putting inserts in their tires as well to give it to give the tire a little bit more structure. Uh, I know you can do that in the mountain bikes with cush core, but it's definitely worth practicing cornering on these gravel tires because when you are losing traction, not like a road bike, how you just straight away wash out and you end up on the deck, these tires let you know when they're gonna release. You'll start feeling the back sliding out, the front, you'll start feeling that sliding out as well, but it's definitely worth practicing, you know, on some local trails near you, um, riding on different surfaces, I suppose, and practicing how fast and how like hard you can lean the bike in, dependent on um, the surfaces and the different cornering that you have. So we've got a nice right-hander here. You wanna make sure you set up before you enter the corner. I hit the apex of the corner, obviously pushing that pedal right to the outside of the bike, and it just gives the bike that much grip. And you can carry so much speed into corners like that. So yeah, go out there, practice with your mates, um, rip into corners, maybe wear some padding if you feel like it's necessary, and uh, get loose. Nice little section here is we're descending off the berg and we don't really know what to expect. I'm following the wheel in front of me and there's a couple of pretty nasty puddles in front. Now you don't know how deep these are, but nothing stops Ryan as he comes flying through. It's the puddles at the deepest point. Keeps it all together, he absolutely loves it. So um, yeah, kudos to Ryan, well played. We've skipped ahead maybe 15 minutes with 70 Ks left in this race and it is hot right now. So obviously my power meter's not registering, but when it does, it spikes up to 700 watts. This is a really fast section of the course, and you can see where the wind's coming from in the map below. We're essentially pedaling into a headwind here, um, coming from kind of the left-hand side, I suppose. So I'm always tending to find myself on the right side of the wheel in front, essentially in the downwind part of the course. You can see Joshy in the rear cam, doing what he can to stay in the mix as well. He's riding really, really strong, all things considered. Um, it's his first gravel ride, but it's not until we make this gnarly left-hander is where the wind space wheels that I'm running get oh put to the tests. Basically, we hook onto this one and it goes from a nice, pretty hard packed gravel um, fire road and it turns into a goat track. There's no better way to explain it. And in this situation, you just have to pray that the person in front of you is leading you on the correct line. Because I've got, what, a metre gap in front of me? I have no idea what's going to be coming. The way I'm riding this section is I'm not planted in the saddle because you don't want to get absolutely shafted by your seat if you drop into a dip i'm kind of keeping off the ta off the saddle keeping the weight in the legs um allows me to keep the bike a little bit more agile and bunny hop different sections if um if it's a little bit too gnarly to roll over but you know you're working so hard to stay with the bunch and the guys at the front are absolutely pinning it and they can because they know what sections in front they know where the fast line is all i can do is just follow the wheel in front and hope to God that he's going to put me in the right line. The heart rate's well up there in the threshold zone, and especially after two hours of riding, um, I'm starting to feel cramps, the fatigue starting to set in. I'm not in a good way. I haven't been able to get nearly enough carbs in. 
Um, I'm just in survival right now, but thankfully, thankfully we're off the goat track because it isn't too long till we hit another gnarly section. So why don't we skip forward and uh, jump into that one? So we've come off the goat track and we're just cruising. Like we've been able to get the heart rate down a little bit, um, but we're going to make a right hand turn. And I'm looking here, being like, oh sweet, we're going to be riding on some uh, some asphalt. It's a highway, you know. Happy days. I can at least sit in, recover there, but. Boy, was I wrong. The guys make a really hard right-hand turn, and now we're riding in a paddock. We're riding in deep, thick grass, and there is no proper line to take. You can see I'm searching all over the road, all over the road, all over the field, to find the right line. Um, and it isn't until I find this little right line over here on the right-hand side where there's a bit of a nice track where you can see probably four-wheel drives and other cars have driven and kind of flattened the grass off. And I'm doing 5, 10 kilometers faster than everyone else. It's not until they've realized that that's the line to be on. Um, everyone jumps back onto my wheel. Now, it's one of those things you, when you are riding so slow and then you finally find that fast line, I feel like you drop more watts because you, you the instinct of going fast is like, it's exciting, it's back again. But, you know, you got to be mindful because that cooks you. You can see in the rear cam, Derek putting a big effort in to bridge across. He's been riding strong all day. And I honestly reckon if he was um, started in the right spot and was able to stay with that front group right at the beginning of the race, he would have put them to the test at the very end. Really strong ride. I'm looking forward to seeing him back at the road and what else, what else gravel stuff he can do in the, uh, in the upcoming season. So... We're on the paddock and it's just an absolute punishment. You can see Josh's bike just bucking him over, trying to get through 300 watts through this section, just trying to keep a nice straight line. It's it's just survival right now. And, you know, you've heard stories, especially in really long grass, it gets sucked up into your derailleur and then horrible things can happen. It can rip it right off the bike. So it's just, you've just got to, be so careful where you put that front wheel. So careful where you um, where you pedal through to in to make sure. Oh, I nearly crashed into that guy, man. That was way too close. Uh, lapse of judgment by me there. You just have to be so lucky to in order to finish this race without any mechanicals. So you can see the end is near. Not of the race, obviously, but of this section just up here. We're going to make another right hand turn. Um, and it's moving it back into a tailwind section, which is very, very thankful. Um, but the guys whack it. You know, we get off this, we hit this really hard packed um, gravel bit. And you can see Derek and Josh put down the hammer, you know, 300 watts, 400 watts, 500 watts, just to try to stay in their wheel. They know exactly what they're doing. They're trying to string the group out. Derek looks behind and knows he's putting some damage in, but. Fortunately enough, I wasn't going to let the wheel go that easily and managed to jump back on where everyone then sits up and um, and waits for the rest of the bunch. Now, the tricky bit with this, you're not going to be able to realise it on camera, but by this stage, your glasses, your sunnies that you're wearing, are just covered in mud. So they're almost unusable. You can't see. So you take them off, chuck them in your helmet, put them wherever. The next issue you have to face is because this is such fine... Um, hard packed gravel it's just getting flicked up into your face from the guy in front or flicked up into your face from your front wheel so you can't win you're either copying you can't see with your glasses because they're covered in mud or you're eating dirt so maybe we need to invent some sunnies that have like tear offs like you have on the downhill and the f1 maybe that's the way to go but even so, this I managed to just get on the front. I wanted to kind of keep a nice pace. I didn't want anyone to attack over me. It is a tailwind section here. Um, so I just wanted to set a comfortable tempo for myself. It was fast enough to stop guys riding over the top of me. Um, and it keeps me in a front, a good front frontal position for we're almost at the closing stages of this first part of the pig and whistle. I've just hit start on the GoPro just as it catches the final berg um, until we've got maybe just under a kilometer till we end the first time section. And you can see in the camera below, there are riders scattered everywhere. You can see Josh putting in some huge efforts in the rear cam, head down, just powering over this little berg. He's featured, I think, another mechanical or, or just misplaced his front tire um, and ended up having to unclip, but he's got back straight on and... Um, 
Roll straight to the front. Meanwhile, I'm absolutely cooked. I'm seeing cross-eyed. 300, 400 watts to stay in the wheels here. And this is really hard um, gravel to ride on as well. It's not smooth. It's rough. It's all over the place. But knowing that we've got just under a K to get to the finish, um, I'm just digging deep. I'm doing whatever I can to stay with the wheels. I don't want to lose too much time in this first section to the rest of the guys, so I'm doing whatever I can. Nutrition played a huge part of this race. Um, I know I spoke about it before, but definitely didn't take on enough carbs considering this race is about four hours long and we're currently just over two and a bit hours into this race. I think I've eaten about 100 grams of carbs. Realistically, the body can take on about 90 grams of carbs per hour. So in a perfect world, I should have eaten a hell of a lot, but it's obviously easier said than done, especially when the chain is tight the entire time. But that pretty much wraps it up, ladies and gentlemen. As we come into the end of the time section, I shut the GoPro off. I've had enough. It's time for me to um, get some nutrition into clunes, grab a Coke and chill out. Um, but for this video, we're gonna call it a day. Thanks so much for watching, guys. If you like this stuff, please hit that subscribe button and I'll see you next time. Ciao.